you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. Hello, and welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. Today, we're taken on a trip around Ireland with author June Gosler Anderson, who's here to discuss her latest book, Hauntings and History of the Emerald Isle. Part travelogue and part paranormal investigation, June's book covers some of Ireland's most notable haunted locations, and often the tragic histories behind these famous ghosts and hauntings. We look at the infamous Lep Castle, the scene of some brutal murders and frightening apparitions, Enniscarthy Castle, which saw tragedy release spirits, June's experiences with table tipping, and some rather amorous and cheeky spirits, as well as several different hauntings from Duncannon Fort. We also discuss one of the ghosts from June's hometown of Anoka, the infamous grey-clad ghost, one of those unique modern hauntings that still tantalises. June's book is released via Beyond the Fray Publishing, and a big thank you to June for joining me today. You can also catch me as a guest host on this week's episode of The Ghost Story Guys, as I join Brennan to discuss some listener encounters with animal ghosts, as well as a couple of my personal favourite stories. As always, you can support the show via our Patreon. You can find the link to sign up in this week's show notes as usual. We're also across all social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube as usual. As always, artwork for the show is by Dean Bestall. The show is produced by Brennan Storr from The Ghost Story Guys and Mysteries and Monsters is pleased to be part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So, let's join June Gosler Anderson for a trip to one of my favourite parts of the world in search of some of Ireland's famous spirits. Today, I am delighted to be joined by author June Gosler Anderson to discuss her new book, Hauntings and History of the Emerald Isle. June, welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. How are we today? Well, we're just fine. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure, June. My pleasure. Now, haunting the history of the Emerald Isle, as, as most people may gather, you're not actually from Ireland. However, you've had a, a real interest in the paranormal for quite a while. So, what was it that led you to discover and take yourself to Ireland in regards to the paranormal, June? Oh, that was Dave Schrader. (laughs) And I think a lot of people are familiar with Dave. I had, starting in, well, 2007, I became a ghost tour for Anoka. And uh, every September and October, I'd guide people through the haunted streets of Anoka and tell them stories about the history and about people who once lived there and are probably still hanging around. And I also teach a class in community ed, and one of the community ed directors contacted me one day and says, hey, June, here's a class you might be interested in. Dave Schroeder is teaching a class on the paranormal. Mm. And I I signed up for it. And in Dave's class, he mentioned they were planning a trip to Ireland, uh, except it was full. (laughs) So, um, but he went the next year too in 2015, and I signed up for that right away. And it was just such an adventure. Mm -hmm. And I I learned so much. It was kind of like um, setting my foot in the waters. I, I really wasn't. To, I, I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about the paranormal. Um, maybe knowledge isn't the best word. Mm. I'd always thought that, uh, I, you know, I was just kind of neutral. Yeah, I've heard yeah. these stories, and some of them, yeah, you know, maybe the door keeps swinging open because it's off balance and, and the like of that. But I learned a lot from Dave, mm. and uh, our trip started with a paracon mm. in Boyle. Yes. which was a bit north of where we were traveling. It's also a capital for UFOs. Yeah. And there was a UFO conference going on at the same time. <laughs> 
And so I uh, sat at a table for lunch with Greg Loss and then one of the UFO guys. And it's just kind of the spider on the wall, you know, listening to the conversation. Yeah. But we had um, a, a series of lectures on uh, various aspects of the paranormal. And I'll tell you, I had a hard time understanding some of those speakers. <laughs> you know, my ears weren't tuned to the Irish dialect. Yes. Um, but one stood out, and it wasn't even a speaker. It, it was a gentleman who just I happened to be talking to after one of the talks. And he told me, he said he had gone on a well, expedition with uh, a group, and they had gone to an ancient graveyard that was on one of the ley lines. Mm. And there was there were basically two graveyards that were connected by an underground tunnel. And uh, so people would travel through the tunnel to get from one site to the other. And it, the trip took about five minutes walking. And the first group went through, and then his group went through. And when they emerged at the other end of the tunnel, they were astounded to find that their watches read an hour later than when they should have arrived. And the people at the other end were just frantic looking for them because they lost track of them. There were vents in the tunnel and they hollered through the vents and no answer. And they were just gone for that period of time and then they reemerged. Mm. And so there, you know, there are stories of, oh, having to do with the fairy folk, I guess, that will enchant you and yeah. <laughs> take you to other places that you don't remember. Yeah, absolutely. Being pixie led or fairy led, as they call it. So that's the term. And basically, that is my biggest memory of the um, Paracon. It was in a king's house. Mm. And we did have an investigation there. And I'm sure there were plenty of spirits around, but we didn't find any. <laughs> so, um, But it, it was a real good introduction mm. to, to the whole world of the paranormal. Yeah. Well, so then we just continued our trip by bus to um, the other spots, which there were quite a few places I chose. Those that really struck out in my mind to write about, but uh, at that, there's quite a few that I wrote about. Yeah. <laughs> and when I, when I got home... I decided that I, I am a writer. I, I've written about well, 10 books to date, several on the paranormal. I call it traveling on the dark side. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I would do this book. And I, I had my notes, but I do a lot of research before yeah. I do the writing. And my idea is, you know, these places may be haunted, but why are they haunted and who's haunting them? Yeah. You know, ghosts doesn't just hop out of the closet and say boo. Mm. I mean, you know, what was it doing there? <laughs> who was who is that ghost? What was it doing there? Uh, when was it uh, roaming around in its human form on Earth? I, I like to delve into the history, and it just connects a lot of the pieces for me. Well, Ireland is is steeped in historical lore and also uh, legends of, of ghosts. For as long as I've had an interest in the paranormal, June, G Ireland has always given us some of the most spookiest places that one goes to. And like you say, when you went over to that Paracon and found out that there was a, a UFO conference happening at the same time, because obviously, as people may or may not know, uh, as you refer to there, Boyle is allegedly the site of uh, what what is known as Ireland's version of the Roswell incident. So, um, okay. so there's been a long-held tradition that a UFO crash landed in Boyle in the mid 1990s, <laughs> and that's where that's where all that's come. But it has been known because it's on the western side of Ireland as a as a real area for people that have had UFO experiences and sightings out there. So I find that quite interesting that you went to the Paracon and it was happening at the same time as a UFO conference, which is you know, um, if you're a lover of ghosts and UFOlogy, you'd be a bit spoilt for choice there, June. Yeah. Well, and you know, the more I learn about this, the more I find find that the, these realms are all interconnected somehow. Mm. You know, the, the paranormal or metaphysical, if you want to call it, mm. um, science, religion, philosophy, literature, history, UFOs. Um, you know, I, I'm beginning to see a lot of interconnections, and that's what makes 
the the study so the discipline is so so interesting yeah. and i really believe with the paranormal we're coming out with a lot of equipment bill chapel has pretty much pioneered that uh and of course there's all the shows on television and a lot of the interest in the paranormal now but i i think we're on the cutting edge of a new frontier mm. i i think it's going to be revealed to us and i'm <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to be around long enough to enjoy it, but I may be back. (laughs) Very true. So, I mean, I think probably that I would suspect, June, that the hardest part of writing your book about the hauntings in in Ireland was was deciding what to cover really because as as I mentioned Ireland has such a long tradition of of locations and castles and forts and keeps and hauntings here there and everywhere it it was probably as hard to work out what you weren't going to look into as it was what you that you fancied covering in the book well for one thing i i was limited by what we had actually visited mm. so uh, everything that is in there is something that place we visited uh and experienced that i experienced myself mm. And I just added to my knowledge of that place. You know, I got home. Mm. And, well, for instance, with Left Castle. Yeah. It's, uh, we met Sean Ryan there, who is a fascinating man. He's, he's a tin pipe player. Mm. And, uh, our group had the run of the place. We were the only ones there. And it was just a nice visit with him. Mm. And he told us a lot. But when I got home, it really whetted my appetite. You know, mm. the story about Left Castle. And I delved into the history, which explains a lot of the hauntings that go on now. Mm. And it, it was the same with the other places. I just thoroughly researched them when I got home, and which always begs the question, you know, should I do this research before I go or when I come home, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, really, I would do it. I, I would go to the place, research it, and then go back mm. and see what I missed. Yeah, yeah, very true. I mean, as you say, Lep Castle is synonymous with with hauntings in in Ireland because it's probably one of the longest running places where strange things are supposed to occur, June. So how did you find it when you went there on your trip? Because obviously, as you, as you refer to there, you probably didn't know as much about the, about the castle and its history as you do now. Right. I was kind of a blank slate when Mm. I went. I read the itinerary, okay, this is where we're going, and, you know, they had a few points of interest on it. But And a lot of the people on the tour were familiar with it. Mm. But I was such a novice that I was just, you know, oh, okay. I just kind of absorbed what what I found, what was told to me, and then went on from there. And I, you know, in retrospect, I think I enjoy my trips more when I get home. Yes. And really, you know, I look at the pictures and I delve into them and and I can just relive them again. And those are my memories of, yeah. of the trip. So I, I've been doing that a lot. And and I find it makes it very real for me. You know, the, the trip itself is just the beginning of the experience. Mm. Mm, I think that is the thing as well, especially as you say with Lep, because there are two or three very famous alleged ghosts there. I know that um, probably one of the most infamous is the is the Bloody Chapel, which is supposed to be the home oh. to a uh, murdered priest who was tragically, well, tragically and brutally murdered in front of his family. That was Thaddeus, yeah. <laughs> and it was one-eyed pig who, who, who murdered him. Mm. These were the carols. And Castle was built by the O'Bannon brothers, mm. which was a plan. And I believe there's a couple of conflicting dates, but I believe it would be like the uh, 13th century, you know, mm. the 1200s. Yes. And um, they they were vying for chieftainship, who is going to be the leader of the clan. And so they had a competition, <laughs> and uh, which involved jumping over or jumping across something um, that uh, was quite dangerous. And whoever made the jump would become the the chieftain. Mm. And the surviving brother uh, became the chieftain, and he built the castle. And so that's why it's called Lep Castle. It's the Lep of the O'Bannons. Yes. And they lived in the castle 
for a while, and then it was taken over by the O'Carrolls. I don't know if it was a peaceful transition or otherwise mm. knowing this. O'Carroll's, they were a very powerful yeah. uh, clan. And if you travel in that part of Ireland, you see they're still prevalent. There's um, O'Carroll stores. Mm -hmm. and I, for, I, I went on a later trip. It was I had a paranormal trip and a normal trip. <laughs> and on the normal trip, we, we visited that area, but not um, uh, Love Castle. And uh, there was... Uh, evidence of the O'Carroll still being there, but they, uh, when the father Mulvaney died, there were two brothers, Thaddeus. The older brother was the priest, and then there was one eyed Teague, who um, was, you can only guess how he lost his eye. Mm. <laughs> um, and they were vying for the uh, chieftainship of the tribe, and one eyed Teague solved the problem when the priest, uh, Thaddeus, was. Thane Mass, there's a high altar. Have you been in the Bloody Chapel? I haven't. I've not been. I've, I've only been outside. I've not had a full tour of the area, so sadly, oh. I've, I've yet to. That will be. It's on my bucket list for when I go back to Ireland. I'm going to do a, a really spooky tour next time I go to. <laughs> well, I got pictures of it uh, mm. in the book. Fabulous. Uh, plus, this, the spiral care staircase that is even scarier than the chapel itself. Mm. But there is kind of carved into the. I, I don't know exactly how they did it, but there is a high altar in there that's just kind of carved into the wall. And they said that's where he would say mass. But uh, one eyed uh, T came in as he was saying what mass one day and stabbed him, and he died across the altar. And ever since then, they've called it the bloody altar. Well, that solved the problem of who was going to be the clan leader, and this was one eyed Teague. And he 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 was <laughs> they were not really nice people, if you want to put it that way. They were very ambitious and, mm. and very bloodthirsty. As I said in the book, blood sport was their game. Yes. And they enlisted the aid of another clan to help them defeat uh, one of their enemies. And this other clan was very skilled in the art of warfare. Mm. And so they trained Hugo Brian's or Hugo Brian Teague's men, one eyed Teague's men, and, and together they defeated this other clan. And so Teague invited them to a victory dinner where they would get their just rewards. <laughs> well, rather than paying him, he, uh, he, he kind of pulled a sneaky one on them. He put a drug, he drugged their drinks. Mm. And when they were unable to resist, he dragged them upstairs. Now, upstairs in the bloody chapel is a, an alcove. It looks kind of like a water closet. And mm. there's a hole in it that you think was a water closet, but it wasn't. It was called the oubliette. Yes. Which is French for the word forgotten. Mm. And the bloody chapel was like three stories higher than the ground floor, and they were thrown down this hole into the oubliette, which was a type of dungeon. Mm. At the bottom of the oubliette was a sharp spike, and the lucky ones landed on the spike and were killed instantly. The less fortunate were left to lie there, wounded and starving to death. And they could hear the sounds of merriment going on in the castle itself, but they, <laughs> and they could smell the food, but they were trapped. There was no escape from it. And that's where they died. This is, this is where he threw the, the other tribe on, on an occasion. And I believe, uh, and this is where my research came in. I, I think it was during the time of Cromwell, where the uh, Scottish mercenaries, mm. uh, you know, the Scots were coming in the Scots-Irish to take over these the lands of, of the Irish. Mm. And a lot of them were hired as mercenaries. And I, from what I could piece together, and, and this is kind of going out on a limb, but I think that they were besieging the castle mm. and were defeated, and the survivors of this were also thrown down the oubliette. Mm. And the proof of this is, uh, you know, we'll jump forward in history to about 1922 and after, 
or maybe it was even later, maybe it was 1958 when they started restoring the castle, but yeah. he dug up three cartloads of bones Yeah. and determined they belonged to, I believe, 300 individuals Yes. who met their death at the hands of Teague O'Carroll. Mm. And, you know, people who die a violent death very often um, are not, <laughs> haven't crossed over yet. They're not quite aware of what happened. And yes. They're still around. It is one of those places as well, June, because I know, I think when they were doing, I think it was the restoration, as you refer to there in the 1950s, I think they also were saying that they came across a pocket watch from the 18th century, which kind of gives you the worrying interpretation of, well, how long were they using this this dungeon to get rid of people, you know? Yeah, or did some stupid visitor just decide to check the time and he dropped it? Oh, whoops. Yeah, well, you'd hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, another kind of chilling tale with that. Mm. So, mm. except it had been, the, the O'Carrolls were no longer there in, in the 18, mm. I think it was 1850, it was engraved. Yeah. Uh, the O'Carrolls had left by then. Mm. With with the coming of Cromwell, they were holding off against the English as long as they could. Mm. And with the coming of Cromwell, I they had to give up the castle. And interestingly enough, they figure into American history. And there were two, well, many of them uh, immigrated to America at the time or just before independence in all well, 17, later 1700s. Hmm. One of them became, uh, I think it was Charles O'Carroll, yeah, Charles O'Carroll of Carrollton, hmm. yes. uh, became a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Hmm. And he was from Maryland, which was a Catholic colony in the New World, which was mainly Protestant. Mm. And uh, he was the last surviving signer of the Declaration, and he they attribute the fact that we the Bill of Rights has freedom of religion, mm. uh, by religion, for religion, encompassed in it is due to his efforts, because he was a Catholic in a very Protestant country. He is very famous in that part. In fact, I was just in Washington, D.C. for Thanksgiving, and there is a kind of a, a park, or not even a park, but there's a, it's a circle of, of stone slabs mm. with the names of the signers of the Declaration of Independence engraved on it. And I took his, I took the picture of his slab. Mm. So um, I, it, it's kind of exciting, you know, you can link it up. Another, uh, his cousin was the first Catholic bishop in the New World, in, in the Americas. So they came in and they made their mark here. And throughout that part of the country, there's a lot of counties that are named Carroll County. They, they dropped the O from O'Carroll. Mm. So that's what happened to that contingent at the time of Cromwell. And Left Castle itself was given to Jonathan Darby. Mm. Now, there's two stories. In, about that. The romantic one is that the first Jonathan, who was actually Jonathan the second or Darby, was a prisoner in Left Castle who was yes. befriended by the or by the daughter of the O'Carrolls who fell in love with him mm. and uh, arranged for his freedom. And as they were escaping, they were accosted by her brother, mm. and Darby slew him with a sword. And then the daughter was heir to the castle, and he took her hand in marriage, and that's how the Darbys became owners, the proprietors of the castle. Well, mm. there's a lot of holes in it. First of all, <laughs> nobody escaped from the dungeon. How did he get the sword, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> the more prosaic approach to that is that Darby was... Um, a, in in Cromwell's army and was rewarded the castle in lieu of payment for his services. Mm. So anyways, he married and took over the castle, and they had a son whose name was Jonathan the Third, and he was called Wild Jack. He uh, he was English, of course, mm -hmm. and and again I'm piecing the story together here. You know what how it probably went down yes. is that. In fighting with the English against the Irish, he attained 
uh, treasure, wealth and treasure that he buried on the grounds of Love Castle. Mm. And he, a couple of servants help him. But he was a little paranoid and he was afraid that if they knew where it was, they might just dig it up and take off with it. So he murdered them. <laughs> and uh, so nobody knew where the treasure was. Mm. Well, the tides of fortune, the tides of war changed, and he was captured by the Irish and put in prison and sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered for treason, which was, you know, a capital punishment in those days. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't carry out the sentence immediately, and he languished in prison until, again, the tide of war turned. And I believe this was with William the Orange taking the throne. He was released from prison, but the time he had spent there had kind of deranged his mind. He was known as Mad Jack. Hmm. And he returned to Left Castle and hoping to regain his treasure, but he couldn't remember where he buried it. And unfortunately, the only ones who knew were uh, dead. Yes. <laughs> and so <laughs> one of the tales is that his ghost is out there still looking for his buried treasure. Hmm. And the, the castle was occupied by a succession of derbies. In the last one, I call him Jonathan the Last. Yes. <laughs> and here it's kept from his grandfather, and I believe the year was 1880. And he married Mildred, what was her, Mildred Dill, hmm. who was a an English woman. Uh, this was not a love match. Jonathan was 35. Mildred was 20. Jonathan was very arrogant. He was cruel. He, he was just not a nice guy. Yeah. Um, I guess we call him an abusive husband now. Mm. Mildred was had literary talents, but this was frowned upon. She was from England, and this was frowned upon by her parents, whose religion just forbade women to uh, dabble in anything as unsightly as literary arts, especially writing. And so they married her off to Jonathan and shipped her off to England. Mm. Well, there were complaints. Well, for his wedding gift, he um, enlarged the castle. At that time, it was just the keep, but he added wings onto the castle. And to pay for it, he sold off land uh, that his tenant farmers uh, depended on for farming, and he raised the taxes on them. And he was just not a real popular guy at all. I mean, he, you know, he's kind of a stinker. Mm. Uh, there were complaints about our stories about the murdered servant. And in tearing down a wall in his excavation, they did discover the bodies of three people buried behind one of the walls, which may hold up for the murdered servant story. So Jonathan and Mildred lived in the castle. Jonathan was way on business quite a bit, which was very fortunate for Mildred because he was just, <laughs> well, it's nice to get him out of the house. They had four children who had no love for his father because he treated them as cruelly as his wife. But the good news was he was gone a lot. And mm. in that time, Mildred became interested in the paranormal, the gothic, and she would hold seances at the castle with her friends. Mm. And it's said that with these seances, they invoked the, the spirits of some of the restless uh, ghosts that were wandering around, and one of them was called an elemental. Mm. This is a creature that was probably put in place by the pagans, who uh, it was, the castle was a sacred site even before the castle was built. And it's thought that the pagans put an elemental in place to guard it. Mm. And probably these spirits coalesced into the spirit of the elemental, which many people had seen, and Mildred especially had encountered it. And I have, in my book, I have Mildred's description of it, mm. that it was a sheep-sized, very gruesome sockets for eyes. It smelled like death. Mm. And and uh, she encountered it on several occasions. Well, Mildred, with all of these spiritual adventures, <laughs> was writing gothic novels. And she wrote under the name of Andrew Mary because uh, she could never publish as a woman. Yes. And she even had the strong voice of a man. She had a masculine voice in her writing. 
and her novels were very, very popular. And she did keep, keep the secret hidden from Jonathan until he discovered it hmm. and forbade her to write and to publish. Well, being a dutiful wife, she did not publish any more of her stories, but she did keep on writing them. And she hid them in a cabinet in the castle. Actually, Jonathan encountered the the uh, um, the the elemental one day, and he was furious. And he accused Mildred of dressing up one of the servants to make a fool of him. <laughs> And it wasn't really the case. Mm. Well, that was uh, 1915. Well, fast forward a few years to like 1921, mm. and uprising is in the air. The uh, Irish, there have been several uprisings, and we can talk about one of them with Enniscorthy Castle. Yes. But probably the... Uh, final, well not the final, but the one that turned the tide, was the uprising of 1922. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was brewing, so Jonathan had time to remove his family and his possessions from Lep Castle and ship them off to England, except Mildred's manuscripts were still locked in the cabinet in the castle. Well, in 1922, the townspeople were so mad at Jonathan and at the Darbys for what they had done that, of course, the way you get even with these Englishmen who have taken over your castles is to blow up the castles. Mm. So they groundskeeper warning, and he got out of there, and they burned the castle, and they put bombs in it, and they <laughs> uh, did a real number on the castle, yeah. and included the manuscripts, which had been locked away. Jonathan wasn't affected. In fact, he came back a year or so later after everything had cooled off from the government was able to collect remuneration for the damage that had been done to the castle. Mm. So he came out okay. He and Mildred, Mildred returned to England. Jonathan remained in Ireland, and that was pretty much the end of their marriage. Mm. So the castle was deserted for the next, well, till 19, I think it was 58 when Peter came. He was, an, he was a descendant of the O'Bannons mm. and bought the castle and started renovating it. But the townspeople would say the castle was boarded up, uh, gates around it were locked. But they said if you passed by there late at night, you could see a flash of light in the bloody castle as if the ghosts were, and I always say, having a party. <laughs> Probably happy for a bit of peace and quiet, June. <laughs> No, I think that they enjoy company myself. Well, I suppose. I suppose it depends on the type of company, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that some of those, you know, investigators get pretty macho. You'll get out here and show yourself. Mm. Well, hey, wait a minute. I dig. You know, you get out of here. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. It is, like you say, it, it, it seems to be just steeped in in so many sad stories and weird things, that place, Lep Castle. It's... It, just seems to have attracted people and i know you know as you touched on with the the originality and the the history of the building you know people were quite violent at certain periods of time so but it does seem that that particular area seems to have attracted a certain type of person as well well you know they talk about negative energy mm. and that basically you know i i think or well, if you go into a prison you know you Feel the negative energy. And, and by the way, prisons are supposedly very haunted and not really <laughs> dangerously haunted. Mm. But, you know, some people sense this negat negativity, this negative energy, the evil mm. in a place just the minute they approach it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in comparison to, as and you slightly mentioned it there, June, Enniscarthy Castle certainly doesn't have the, the probably an international reputation like LEP does, but it's certainly a, a very well-known haunted location. How did you find it when, in, on your visit? Well, we actually visited with the ghosts there. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, most of it I, I hear stories because I, I'm not psychic. I don't have a sixth sense. I'm, you know, I'm 
basically an observer, which is probably a good place to be when you're dealing with this, mm. because I, that gives you some protection. Yes. Um, but we did um, have some experiences there. Ennis Corsi is uh, in in Wexford, mm. which is on the southeast coast of Ireland. The um, castle, like many Irish castles, you know, changed hands. But in the rising, uh, during the rising of 1798, mm. it was in the hands of the English. And across the way from Enniscorthy is a hill, it's known as Vinegar Hill, yes. which uh, figures into this history. Well, in 1798, there were, there were a lot of risings across Ireland, which were pretty swiftly put down by the English, except in, in, in Wexford. And there, the pikemen were able to hold off the Englishmen for a month, which was unthinkable. But in the end, Irish pikemen are no match for English muskets, and uh, they were finally overthrown, although there was a hole in the English lines that allowed a lot of the Irish to escape. Those that weren't so lucky to escape were hauled off to Enniscorthy, and uh, as any good castle worth its merit, worth its salt, uh, it had a dungeon, which was hewn out of the rock that it was built on. Hmm. And they were thrown in this dungeon to basically languish until they died. When we visited Enniscorthy, the castle was uh, in beautiful shape. In fact, it had been lived in by an English couple for many years until 1950s, maybe. Yes. When they turned it to the Wexford Historical Society, and they made a museum out of it. And the Wexford Paranormal Society will host groups in there, and we were the, their guests on this night. Mm. And it, it was a moonlit night. I think it was the night of the blood moon. It was a large moon. Mm. And I, I remember seeing it kind of perched atop one of the parapets of the castle. It, it was quite a sight. But uh, Michael Benson was our host, and he greeted us and brought us in. And uh, we were, uh, there were about 40 of us in the group, and we were had an orientation with the Wexford Paranormal Society, and we were divided into four groups. My group stayed in the living room, hmm. and I was kind of surprised because they rolled up this huge rug that covered the floor, yeah. where it was just wooden floor. And on this, there was a television tray, you know, like the wooden ones that are so common all over. Yes. They had a light shining on the legs of the tray, so we could see there wasn't anything connected to it. Mm. And the lights were dimmed, and we were instructed to uh, a number of us to place our fingertips lightly on the top of the table. Mm. While we did this, our guide from the Wexford Paranormal Society uh, was talking to whatever spirit happened to be in the room. And she said, it's usually Andrew or John, she said, and they're not friends. Mm. But uh, in talking to her, she said, well, show us that you're here, you know, just make the table move. And the table started tipping a little bit back and forth. Mm. And we weren't doing it. There was no way we could do it because of the weight of our fingertips. We couldn't really move the table. And so it tipped, and we were pretty impressed by this. But she said, sometimes that table tips all the way to the floor. <laughs> you know, unbelievable. Well, our next station that our group went to was a room that was dark, and it had kind of a rough table on it. And there was a glass, uh, a short squat glass, mm. with a an, an electric votive under it. It worked kind of like a Ouija board. Yeah. And we could actually, if one of the ghosts was in there, we could talk, communicate to the ghosts this way. And so, again, we were instructed to put our fingers lightly on top of this glass and ask a question. If it moves sideways, it was a yes. If it slashed downwards, it was a no. And it would also spell out short answers. Mm -hmm. So we started asking it questions. 
and I have that dialogue. I, I, sometimes I remember things verbatim. Yeah. And this is one of those things that I pretty much remembered. So naturally, the first question was, what is your name? And the glass spelled out, Andrew. When did you die? 1798. And that was the year of the uprising. Mm. How old were you when you died? And the glass said, 23. Were you an Irishman? And the glass indicated, yes. Were you captured? Again, yes. Then what happened? And the glass spelled out, dungeon. How long were you there? Six months. Did you die there? Yes. Were you married? No. Did you have a sweetheart? Yes. And we learned that she later married. Did mm -hmm. you live in Wexford? No. Where did you live? Five miles. Then we tried to uh, find out his profession, and we were racking our brains trying to think of, you know, what a person might have been doing 200, over 200 years ago. So we named mm. Farmer, Cooper, no, Blacksmith, <laughs> no, all the trades and occupations we could think of that were relevant at the time. And uh, each was answered with a downward splash, no. And somebody said, were you a soldier? And bingo, the glass said, yes. And did you kill anyone? No. And then we learned later that John, this was Andrew answering our questions, and we learned that John was one of the British soldiers who was his one of the prison guards, basically. And they, for obvious reasons, they didn't like each other very well. Mm. But... Um, uh, and we learned from another group, they asked, you know, how did you die? And it was bayonet to the throat. But John was uh, apparently not his killer. So um, we uh, left that room kind of <laughs> stunned and awed. Mm -hmm. And we met another group, the group that was coming out of the table tilting room. And one of them was a good friend of mine, Faye. She had been in that group, and, and mm. I heard bits and pieces of the story. And later in Minneapolis, I had coffee with Faye, and I said, Faye, what happened in that room? And she told me that they were in with a tipping table, and they had their fingers on the table, and one in the party was a rather attractive blonde girl. Mm that apparently the spirit took a liking to <laughs> because the table started tipping violently back and forth and back and forth all the way to the floor. And then it took off. It started chasing this girl. <laughs> and those with their fingers on top of it were running to keep up. And it <laughs> chased her into the next room and cornered her against the bed. <laughs> and she was terrified. Yeah. And, and Faye said, I, I, I coaxed it back in, into the other room, calmed it down and, and, and coaxed it back. And, and so we all went back into the other room. And it turns out that it was uh, John, and he apparently was a bit horny. So <laughs> that, was, that was her story. <laughs> And then we, uh, our third station was in one of the uh, parapets. They, this castle is it's a, a keep, and it's a drum castle. It's mm. surrounded by four drum towers, mm. uh, one on each corner, and then they have a parapet on top. Yeah. And so we went up to one of the parapets with a Frank's box. And uh, as you know, a Frank's box is uh, it's kind of a radio that keeps switching frequencies to try and find a frequency that uh, any ghost <laughs> flying through might find convenient and might just leave a message on. Mm. <clears throat> so I find them really annoying because they're so full of static. Yes. But apparently they do work from time to time. So we went up there because we thought, well, if any spirits were winging their way through, you know, it'd be a good place to catch them. But because of the traffic, it was too noisy to uh, get anything out of it. So we took the Frank's box down to the dungeon, 
And as we were coming out of there, a group was coming up laughing like mad. And they said, yes, you did, Jeff. And no, I didn't do it. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And they were teasing Jeff, one of the guys in the group, mercilessly. Hmm. And so we went down to the dungeon, uh, which is not a comfortable place. You know, it doesn't have a flat floor. Hmm. And we were standing there. I'm trying to brace myself against a wall, but the floor is kind of sloping away from the wall, and I kept sliding down. <laughs> but we put the prank box in the middle of the floor, and uh, one of the guys said, uh, when the last group was here, there was a rather embarrassing incident. Can you tell us who did it? And I don't know if uh, <laughs> you can spell out the incident, but it was a loud, rather rude noise. <laughs> and 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 the box said Jeff, <laughs> and it said Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. So you know we had proof con- conclusive that Jeff was the culprit. <laughs> and so with that, we went back upstairs, and the Wexford Panera- Paranormal Society had prepared us a lovely snack, mm. <laughs> and, and we teased Jeff some more, and he still insists that he didn't do it. In fact, I've been with him on later trips, and he still say, no, it wasn't me. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that was our story with that. Um, when I was researching this, I wanted to get stories from the group as well, hmm. and I had to get their pictures because I had taken all of mine on an iPad, which I lost. Had never oh. found, and there a lot of the pictures you'll see credits from other people mm. uh, who are kind enough to send me their pictures, yeah. but also their stories. And one of the interesting stories I got from Sharon Leon and her sister Anne, and, and I'll read it for you. Well, my sister and I were in the dungeon of Enniscorthy Castle. The spirits we communicated with claimed that they are alive and that they actually live in another dimension, not ghosts, but other dimensional beings in the dungeon with us that night. You know, those spirits have been hanging around the castle for over 200 years Mm. and probably playing pranks on each other to amuse themselves. So you think they might have been putting us on as well? (laughs) Yeah, I I think there might be a bit of leg pulling going on there, Jim. I kind of think so, you know, it, it was like, <laughs> huh, you know, back to UFOs and, and uh, the six, all the dimensions, that, but I thought about it, I said, eh, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, well, Ennis Corthy is, is quite a, a haunted location as well, because I think the, the one thing that's quite striking about the castle is it's essentially in the town centre, isn't it, as well? So it's quite yeah. unusual, because a lot of castles are on their own, or they've got their own grounds, whereas... It seems like the town of Enniscorthy has grown up around the castle, um, and I know that the there is a theatre that there is next door to the castle, which also has a long history of haunting, but is is fairly modern. So yeah, theatres are, are notorious for being haunted. I didn't know about that theatre though. Mm. Well, uh, I've, I've got a couple of things about that because it was it was I'd never heard of the castle, but I'd heard of the ghosts in the theatre. Strangely enough. Oh. Good. Yeah, what about them? Um, well, they're the usual, typical uh, theatre ghosts that they tend to, you know, they're the ones that sort of, you, people hear them whispering in their wings and, and occasionally they'll see people walking about when they're on stage doing dress rehearsals and things like that and lights go on and off and makeup and things disappears from the dressing room. So, you know, the typical mischievous theatre ghosts that we get, June. You know where they would really come in handy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do some theater work, and I memorizing lines is like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> it would really be nice if you had a theater ghost as your muse who would whisper your lines in your ear. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I completely agree. I've spoken to a couple of paranormal investigators, um, Mike Huberty, strangely enough, who's also from Wisconsin. Um, and we were talking uh-huh. about a ghost in a theater as well that always whispers to people, good luck. When they go on stage. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot lot better if they just tell you their lines. <laughs> you know, the, the, the ghostly prompter. Yes. That that would be 
I don't, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, I might write a book about that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so one of the other places you visited in Ireland that has uh, a well-known history is, is Duncannon Fort, which is one of those places where it's it's once again had a very tumultuous past June and it's, you know, seen scenes of violence and attempts to take it. Because I know, I think Cromwell failed in his attempt to take the fort um, and had to leave it with his tail between his legs until later on and, and someone else managed to get hold of it. But that that's another place I think you you visited on your trip as well, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, and just kind of skipping past the history, there is the story there of um, I'm just kind of looking for it because uh, there there are two forts. Mm. Uh, one is Charles Fort and one is Duncannon. Yes, and I I I, I have been in both of them, but. I was kind of looking for the stories, and in, um, I believe, with Duncannon Fort, it, it was one of the few places in County Wexford that did not fall under United Irishmen during mm. the 1798 Rebellion. You know, back to that, mm. it was so controlled by the English, and it was defended by Irishmen who were called the Crappy Boys. Yes. Uh, due to their short or cropped haircut. After the fall of Westford, these Crappy Boys were rounded up and sent to cells, and then they were hung as traitors. And one of those, actually a song was written about him. Uh, it was a, a young boy who um, was hung along with, with the others. Mm. And uh, the song... I, I wrote a verse of the song. There's many more verses, but I, I did put this verse in my book. "Twas in Duncannon this young man died, and in Duncannon his body lies. So all good people who do pass by, just drop a tear for the crappie boy. Mm. It was the story of the poor unfortunate lad who's seeking to escape from the British. And at the same time, a British soldier was trying to get away from the Irish mob. And so the British soldier, to escape, goes into a church, and he grabs a, uh, a priest's vestment, and he hides out in the confessional. <laughs> and the crappy boy is seeking absolution for his sins. He enters the confessional and pours his heart out to the British soldier priest, mm. who, upon hearing his story turns him over to the uh, authorities. He's dragged up to the dungeons below Duncannon, and the sto this verse that I just read is about this poor crappie boy mm. who was hung mm. for seeking absolution. Yeah. So, and some have heard the boy's cries, and uh, others have witnessed the ghost of this tragic young figure. Hey. So, and, and there's sightings of spirit ghosts and phantoms and prisoners. Mm. Now they're creeping going on in Duncannon. So it's home to numerous phantoms, shadows, disembodied voices. Mm. And they've even seen a paranormal patrol of soldiers in the courtyard keeping watch out for a phantom enemy. And the Fort's mess hall houses one of the location's most active ghosts, featuring the soldier of uh, the ghost of a soldier who took his own life, mm. and um, and it, it's a love story. It was a love triangle, and this lowly soldier um, had the unfortunate, unfortunately, fell in love with the wife of his commanding officer, mm. who loved him in return. But faced with the prospect of unrequited love, the soldier took his own life, and it, it said that his. Uh, ghost also haunts um, Duncannon Fort. I've been to the fort. Um, you know, I think it would be a good project for restoration. Mm. It's fascinating, but so much of it is destroyed. And uh, Duncannon, I believe, was blown up during the 1922 rebellion. Yes. Uh, by the Irish. Mm. And they they do a they do a really good job on their historical places of destroying them, <laughs> but but it it would be really neat to see that place uh, restored. Yeah. So another another place we visited was um, 
uh, Charlesfort. Yes. Been there? Uh, no, I have heard of it because it's supposed to be haunted by one of our typical British ghosts, an Irish ghost, which is a white lady, June. Yes, well, I have the story of the white lady in my book, mm. and uh, her name was Winifred, uh, and she fell in love with um, uh, Colonel Warrender. Mm. No, her father was, uh, or she was Winifred Warrender, mm. and she fell in love with uh, Trevor, who was an up and coming uh, commander in uh, at the regiment stationed there, uh, and they had a beautiful love affair going. And on the day of their wedding, Winifred and 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 Trevor went for a hike along the battlement, and these rise high above, right on the English Channel, and. Uh, Winifred spied some beautiful flowers on the bank leading up to the uh, to, to the wall in the battlement, and she just said, "Oh, I would love to have some of those flowers." Mm. Well, uh, Trevor decided that he would, you know, her wish was his command. Yes. So they had a beautiful wedding, and you know the whole garrison turned out, except for the soldiers who were uh, in the guard towers, uh, keeping watch for any incoming, probably Spanish ships at that time. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was a lot of merriment, a lot of dancing, a lot of drinking. And Trevor decided that he would fill his wife's dream of having some of those beautiful wildflowers as a wedding gift. So he went along the battlement and he approached the soldier in the sentry tower and commanded him to go down and pick some of the wildflowers. Now, the sentry was between a rock and a hard place because to abandon your post was punishable by death. Mm. And there were similar <laughs> similar punishments for disobeying yes. a commanding officer. Yes. So, you know, okay, what's he going to do? Well, Trevor, sensing his plight, said, I'll stand watch for you while you go uh, picking the wildflowers. Hmm. So he uh, stood watch in the, uh, along the sentry post. He's kind of leaning over his rifle. Um, and it took the sentry a while because it was quite a scramble. In the meantime, uh, Winifred's father, Colonel Warrender, was taking a walk along the wall, inspecting the uh, sentry post to make sure everybody was doing their duty. When he came upon this one sentry post with the sentry's back turned to him and he was slumped over his musket, obviously asleep. Mm. Well, the colonel was furious with this, and he took out his pistol and he shot him in the back through the heart. And he commanded commanded other troops to come up and remove this body and bring it to the square where he would use it as an example of what happens to sentries who fall asleep at their post. And so they brought it down to the square, they turned the body over, and lo, it was Trevor the bridegroom, dead, shot dead by his father-in-law. Mm. Well, both Winifred and, and the uh, colonel or uh, the commander were just aghast at what had happened. And that night, Winifred was walking the parapets. should have been the night of her honeymoon. Instead, she was walking the wall, and she came to the sentry tower, and her grief was so great that she just flung herself over the walls and into the depths of the sea. Mm. And the colonel was so consumed with guilt and sadness that he killed himself as well. And so they say to this day that um, Winifred, the white lady, you can see her walking the parapets on her wedding night in her wedding gown. But, of course, her lover, her husband, has been shot dead by her father. So it's a very it's a very tragic story. You know, one interesting thing is about ghosts is that, you know, it, it can be a, um, a reoccurring ghost mm. where the scene was so tragic and made such an impression that with the right conditions, it just repeats itself over yeah. and over. Uh, in time, you know, the white lady may fade to the gray lady 
Mm. May say to the transparent lady to <laughs> nothing that after time, you know, maybe the 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 real kind of <laughs> the film wears out. And, yeah, yeah, and and they're gone. Yeah, a bit like the stone tape theory, uh, June, where yeah, because it's it's such an emotional event, and, you know, and obviously, you know, the loss of of your son-in-law, and then the fact that your daughter then kills herself as well because she's overcome with grief, and you take your own life because of what you've done. That is such an emotional outpouring of events that appeared, you know, that happened over such a small period of time. If anything was going to sort of imprint itself on on the very environment it's based in, it would be something such, you know, such an emotionally charged story as that, wouldn't it? It would. You know, speaking of stone tape theory, that was, I, I read about that in Richard Felix's book, I think it was Ghost, um, when it, I mm. was in England a couple of years later, and, and uh, we had a delightful tour with him, and yes. I bought his book, which was fascinating. But maybe, wh why don't you tell us? about the stone tape theory. Yeah. I'm not sure I've got story read. I'd like to hear from someone else. Well, as my understanding and everything I've ever said is that there will be certain emotional environmental situations, June, that will uh, that will allow an event or emotions to imprint themselves on a building or an area that will occasionally, once again, when the perhaps someone is there who is feeling emotionally charged, either way, or the environment or the, the weather even is at, at such a point that it will cause the event that caused the original incident to repeat itself to the witnesses. And it's a long-held tradition that, as you refer to, in some instances, the stone tape eventually gets weaker and weaker the longer it's gone on and eventually will cease but in certain some incidences that the event is so emotionally charged that it will continue regardless and will always repeat itself for whoever is there in the right time frame for it to occur yeah you know he explained uh, a little bit of the technology behind this too mm. that you liken it to a, a videotape or what is it a tape on your vhs yes yeah or tape recorder mm. that these are uh basically silicon tapes with iron particles that pick up the magnetism mm. picks up the the image yeah and if you look at a building you know there's your silicone yeah. in in the stone or the brickwork and of course there's iron in uh especially in minnesota yes um in so much uh, of the stone that you know this would magnetism in this would attract it and record it mm. Mm. You know, I said we're on, on the next frontier, you know, where technology is kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, mm. <laughs> that, that kind of works. <laughs> yeah, very true, because so, one of the things I know about where you live is, is one of my favorite ghosts in the whole of your state, June. And, and yeah. Is known, I believe it's known as the grey clad ghost, which is allegedly a, a, a gentleman called Bill Andberg who used to jog and. Oh, German <laughs> Yeah, so that's supposed to be a recurring ghost of people seeing him jog through the local area, is that right? Yeah, what have you heard about him? Well, he's, he's one of those where um, he used to, he was known for being a regular jogger and he would always wear a certain outfit when he went jogging. And he's still sighted on certain occasions where people will see him just running through certain areas. Well, yeah, uh, just to add to this story, mm. um, I remember when he was alive even, uh, yeah. and I, he, w he was a doctor, and he uh, was a jogger, but his favorite jogging place was the cemetery mm. in Anoka. Yes. <laughs> and he would jog along these cemetery trails. And uh, so it is said that people visiting the cemetery uh, may see him from time to time. It's called the Grey Ghost. And his outfit was always like grey sweats that mm. he wore. But that's interesting that that 
story has, has gotten all the way across the big divide from uh, you know us to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll watch. I'll watch any documentary that mentions ghosts in the title, usually June, and I like to watch ghost collections about different states and areas of America because it's it's interesting and it takes me and ta- takes me to places that I've never heard of or only know a very little amount about so that was always one that's really struck with me because it's it's quite a unique ghost that you've got somebody who's still jogging in the afterlife well i am just uh i i didn't thought much about it i'm so glad you brought it up (laughs) (laughs) well well because like yeah he was a local legend while he was alive and i guess he still is well he's well he's dead and what better place you know than anoka absolutely yeah very true because i know when we when we spoke before we started the interview proper we were talking about the fact that anoka is is known as the halloween capital of the world june because this year should have been the centenary of the first parade that was done to try and stop the local youths causing uproar and mayhem as they did on all hallows eve in the past (laughs) okay well in 2000 my husband died in 2007 Hmm. and i pretty much decided okay i'm going to um start a new chapter in my life Hmm. and just explore things and Anoka had fascinated me I'd been on a couple of ghost tours and I decided that I would become a ghost tour guide for Anoka and so I did and as as I said before I was kind of neutral about this you know it's like yeah you know I don't believe or disbelieve and and um you know, people have had these experiences in, in whom I would say, oh, you're crazy. But as I was giving the tours, people would start telling me their stories. Mm. And I heard some pretty good ones. So I started thinking, well, maybe there's more to it. Well, Anoka is known as the Halloween capital of the world, and they've really capitalized on it. Yeah. But back at the beginning of the last century, Halloween, which is all Saints, all Hallows Eve, because All Saints Day is the next day, mm. and the legends have it that the dead, the spirits rise from the grave for a night of mischief upon this earth. <laughs> and in Anoka, as in many other places, they were aided in their mischief by the local spirits who weren't quite dead yet. <laughs> um, my dad was one of them in his day. And they would do things like uh, tip over outhouses and soap windows. And in Anoka, they were especially ingenious. One Halloween, a, a group of uh, enterprising young spirits took apart a buggy and uh, <laughs> reassembled it on top of the courthouse. And another Halloween, they had uh, released a herd of cows in the street, down Main Street. Um, they got into the local jail and also a classroom where they, it's reported they ate a few algebra books. <laughs> well, the stuff was getting, is the pranks were getting cut, some of the pranks were getting pretty mean. And the local citizenry was talking about arming themselves. Yes. And so the city fathers decided they didn't want this mayhem in their fair city. So they thought, okay, maybe if we have something going on to distract them, they won't uh, be doing creating so much mischief on Halloween. Mm. So they organized a parade, and they invited everyone to be in it. The, the school children were invited to wear costumes and march in it. They had float. They had the high school band. They had the Legionnaires band, and they even had the nurses from the Hanoka Insane Asylum marching in the parade. <laughs> and after that, they had a big citywide party. And it was so much fun that they decided to do it the next year, which they did. It was even bigger and better. And so every year they have had this big celebration. They have not only one parade now, but two parades. Mm. And one uh, Saturday parade and then an evening parade, which, by the way, isn't held on Halloween necessarily. <laughs> But they do party. There's a lot of decorations up in the town in that. So this has continued for a 100 years, except for two years during World War II, when they didn't think it would be patriotic. Mm. And ironically, 2020, the centennial year, Mm. when everything was shut down. 
But Anoka still celebrates this heritage, and we hope to get back to it again pretty soon. Mm-hmm. I, I had a lot of fun leading these. Actually, I um, I do a talk on it. I, I, I developed some PowerPoint talks. One of them is on Ghosts of Anoka, which is for civic events, a lot of senior facilities like me to come in. It's a PowerPoint, so I've got a lot of pictures as well as the stories with it. And I've got one on Ireland also. Ah, fantastic. Um, (laughs) So I've I've been hoping to do them over Zoom, but they kind of like them live, so I can hardly wait to get back to that. So what's next for you now, June? What's your next project after this book on on the history of Ireland and its and its wonderful ghosts. Where are you planning on going next, or what's your next writing project about? Well, I am really looking forward to a paranormal trip to Scotland. Mm. It was planned as with Dave. We had planned it for last September, but guess what happened? Yeah. It's been rebooked for June, and with a little luck and some uh, immunization, Yep. Maybe it will be safe to go. Mm. Um, it, it will complete my trilogy. I was in England uh, with Dave and the Paranormal Group. I was also in Romania, Transylvania, with mm. them. But it will complete my, my British Isles tour. Yeah. I, I'm just, uh, and I think I may read up on it a bit more before I go. <laughs> so have you got any particular places you're going to visit when you go to Scotland then, June? Well, we have the itinerary. Mm. Um, and I know Loch Ness yep, uh, yep. was, and I, I'm not too familiar with the places. Mm. Uh, we did have an itinerary. Whether those will still hold for this trip, I don't know. Mm. But I'd really love to have your input on uh, on it. Well, you can't. Because, yeah, you can't go to Scotland oh, and not go to Edinburgh. That's all I'll say. Especially if you're doing ghosts. Uh, Okay, so all right, Edinburgh. How about Glasgow? Is that? Yeah, Glasgow's got a, a, a very spooky history as well. They both, both the major cities in Scotland, Glasgow and, and Edinburgh, are both steeped in uh, in paranormal law. Uh, Edinburgh more so because it has a very infamous ghost known as the Mackenzie Poltergeist, which, depending on which source you read, is either the best advertised ghost hunt in the country or it's a really nasty ghost. I'll just say that. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Well, we have a few sites here that I would like to go. I would like to visit, mm. um, like Salem. Yes. <laughs> this book, um, the book was originally History and Hauntings of the Emerald Isle, mm. which I published under my own publishing company, which is Granny Girl Press. Yep. And Dave called me one day and said, Hey, June, there's a paranormal publishing company known as Beyond the Fray uh, is interested in reprinting it. So so I talked to them, and we got together on it. They did the book basically verbatim. I added some stuff about Mildred Darby, basically, mm. uh, to Left Castle. Uh, we screened the, the pictures. So the book came out with a wonderful cover, very much unlike mine, which was kind of prosaic. Mm. Um, and it's now called Hauntings and History of the Emerald Isle. They reversed it. Yes. Um, in talking to them, I told them about my next project, and it's also one I do a talk on. It's Tracking Dracula. Mm. In 2018, I went with Dave and my paranormal peeps to Romania. Yes. And we visited the castles, which are in beautiful shape, by the way, yes. that are associated with uh, Vlad the Impaler, mm. who was the prototype for Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mm. And so the book encompasses more than Romania. It starts basically with Bram Stoker. Yes. And have you ever been to St. Michael's in Dublin? Yes, I have. I've been. Dublin's one of have my favourite places in the entire world. I love it. I've been three or four times. Have you been in the crypts? Yes, I have been in the crypts. Yeah, I've done done the whole tour, and I've been in the wonderful university and the library, and I did the ghost tour in Dublin as well. But my story starts with Bram Stoker, 
and a lot of his influence or a lot that influenced him was in the crypt you know where those mummies were mm. and, and then uh, it tells about it, it tells about Bram Stoker in fact I was at a author talk in our library in Anoka County here and I met Zachary Stoker yes. who is his great Grand nephew who has written a book called Draco, and I've been reading the book. I have my picture with uh, with Dacre, wishing me good luck on <laughs> on on uh, the talk that I was getting together, tracking Dracula, mm. and uh, just a uh, handsome man. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but so, anyways, it goes from Bram Stoker's early beginnings in Dublin. He was a Dubliner to England, where he worked for Sir Henry Irving, who is a leading stage actor, Shakespearean actor of the yes. time. Yes, very and famous. Also, at it, and I've, I've got some of his story, and also Ellen Terry. Mm. By the way, my daughter, I was taking Shakespeare when I was pregnant with my daughter. Her name is Terry Ellen. Ah. Talk about influence there. <laughs> but in, and it goes up to Whitby, England, which we visited on our England tour. You know, that beautiful be ruined. Yes. And, and that's where, in the Dracula story, Dracula comes ashore. He does, yes. When he lands. And so, uh, and from there, I take it from Dracula coming ashore to our Romanian excursion and the Hunyadi Castle, Corbin Castle, uh, and kind of the reign of terror of Vlad the Impaler. Mm. I mean, when we talk about tough times to be living in Ireland, you know, during Cromwell and that. Yep. I mean, man impaled. He murdered 80,000 people and impaled 20,000 of them. Mm. Uh, you know, about horrible times to be living. But I've tracked his story and these castles associated with him in the history. And I have put it together now as a paranormal presentation and I'm planning to expand on it um, bring in probably a little more of the travelogue of places to visit in Romania Transylvania, Wallachia uh, especially mm. um, and either you know I'll do it myself as Granny Girl Press or if Beyond the Fray is interested you know I have it published by them so um, yeah it, it's uh, it's exciting you know there's just the more the more you learn the more there is to know <laughs> Absolutely, very true. Well, that's fantastic, and I look forward to seeing that June, whichever way it comes. So, if anybody's interested in your work and wants to get hold of a copy of your wonderful book or follow your previous books that you've released, where can they find your website and, and find some more details on where to get them? Okay, um, my books are all listed on uh, Amazon. You can find it under my name, June Gosler Anderson, which lists all of them. They're not all paranormal. I've got a few children's books in there and a couple of basically autobiographies. Yeah. And I've got History and Haunting of the Anoka Masonic Lodge as one of my paranormal as well as this. Um, so Amazon.com under my name or under the title of the book, Haunting and History of the Emerald Isle. Mm -hmm. And Be Beyond the Fray also has them. Yep. Uh, the publish who could be contacted. Well, that's fabulous. Well, like I say, June, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it and following your investigations and explorations of Ireland, uh, and it clearly had a, a big impact on you as a as a tourist and as a as a lover of the paranormal. So, thank you for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you, and I wish you the continued success with your writing. Well, thank you so much, Paul. It was a pleasure to be on your show. 